Welcome to our webinar this morning, Building Resilient Applications Using Data-Centric AI. I'm John Marini, Director of Growth here at Snorkel AI, and I'll be your host for today's event. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Arjun Prakash. Arjun heads Snorkel AI's investments in new use cases and solutions, as well as Snorkel's business and development efforts. Arjun joined Snorkel AI from Palantir, where he was an early employee of the commercial business. And over eight years, he built and headed various business units, including healthcare, financial services, and commercial strategy. Prior to Palantir, Arjun was a researcher at BlackRock and Siemens Corporate Research and has, done, has a degree in electrical and computer engineering from Cornell University. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Arjun and we'll go from there. Uh, thanks a lot, John. Um, and welcome everyone. I am so humbled and excited to uh, that you were able to join me for this conversation on how we can build more resilient applications, especially in the context of an enterprise which has very dynamic needs. And to just prompt why I'm so excited and passionate about this, over my decade plus career in AI and data systems, I've noticed that one of the most important aspects of value creation from a data or an AI application is to ensure that it's resilient to the needs of a dynamic business because inputs change, be it for whatever reason, customer behavior might change, uh, outputs change because uh, business objectives might change, uh, product SKUs might change. And it's really important for a data and AI application system to be resilient and adaptive to those needs so that the business can bet on value creation. So the way I want to maybe have this conversation is by talking a little bit about some of the different approaches to building automation and AI systems, starting with the very simplest, building up to machine learning models, talk about their various pros and cons, and then derive from first principles a approach that combines the best of all worlds to create a resilient AI application. So without further ado, I want to get started with maybe the first and most simplest but most prevalent of these systems, which are rule-based systems. And rule-based systems are really very prevalent and have been around for decades. And at its very core, they allow a user to encode a cause-effect relationship. And they have many advantages that come with them. Firstly, and most importantly, they're very transparent and auditable. And there is a very clear logging of what the business logic that goes into it is. And the benefit of this is that it's very approachable to a non-technical SME. And when you combine these, what you end up with is high iteratability. So when an SME notices that something's not working or they want to make an improvement to the system, it's very easy to make a small change, test the consequences of it, and make an update to the system. So it has very high iteration factor, and that makes it very adaptable. But the flip side of it is that it suffers from an inability to model complexity. So if the business process has low variance and is simple, a rule-based system works pretty great. But if you need to generalize and model a lot of complexity, such as, for example, in diagnostics or maybe in some more complex predictive applications, these can really quite fall short. And that brings me to the next kind of application, which is the machine learning model. And these have become really prevalent over the course of the last one or two decades, especially with the commoditization of compute and of the models themselves, like, for example, the various um, deep learning models that now have just become very prevalent in open source repositories. Uh, these, these models are very data hungry. If you give them a large enough corpus of quality training data, they're very good at learning complex hidden relationships that sometimes we even we ourselves don't understand, like, for example, in some of the foundation models. But Really what makes these models very successful is a large quantity of high quality labeled training data. And to really motivate what I mean by high quality training data, I wanna give you an example of the counterfactual. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen the example that you're seeing um, on, the, on the screen right now. I'll just give you a second to read through it. So back in 2020, it was discovered that pretty much the entire Scots version of Wikipedia, which is the part of Wikipedia written in the Scots language, 
wasn't written by a Scots linguist or even somebody from Scotland. It was actually written by an American teenager who did not speak Scots. And this has some very obvious consequences in terms of people learning the wrong, having the wrong takeaways of Scots. But more profoundly, you have these large language models that are trained on Wikipedia. And these large language models get and end up getting used in chatbots, voice agents, and promulgating their inferences to tens of millions of people. And at an extreme end, these large language models are used to write Wikipedia articles at times. And in this sense, they create this vicious circle and in the process end up overwriting the history and culture of 1.5 million people's language. And what this really elucidates and in a very extreme example, but also a very real example is your training data really matters. It's important to create high quality training data and have ways to audit and govern it to ensure that you're feeding your model good quality stuff. And this is really being the core tenet of computer science for a long time, garbage in, garbage out. And this prompts the question, right? So how do enterprises create training data? And there's really just two approaches that organizations take today. The first is uh, they might use a labeling vendor or they might choose to label it internally. So if you, but each of these have, a, have their drawbacks. If you use a labeling vendor, there are some issues. Like for example, the most obvious is privacy, right? So if you're working with very sensitive healthcare data or uh, financial transaction data, then you don't really have the privilege to be able to send it outside of your firewall to some external party. Uh, that is a very obvious issue with using external vendors. But even beyond that, the external vendors don't have the expertise to deal with the nuance that your internal practitioners might have about your data. So a very obvious example of this is healthcare, right? So if you're a pharma company or say a provider, your biologists and your practitioners fundamentally understand the nuance of the diagnostic or about the drug that external parties, even if they have an education in biology, might not necessarily understand. And this really compromises the quality of your training data. And let's say, for example, you get it labeled and you come back and your practitioners find some errors. Each of these iteration cycles with an external party ends up being quite long because there's a person on the other end you're dealing with. It's being manually labeled. And what usually ends up happening is people just compromise on the quality of the training data that they use for their model building application. Now, some organizations might decide to deal with this by bringing the labeling in-house. So you have the right people looking at the data, but what often ends up happening is you don't have enough of them. And not only do you have not enough of the practitioners, they have day jobs. They are running business processes or research that takes up a lot of their day. And this is something that they need to create additional time for. And this really results in, again, long cycles to iterate. And that results in having to compromise and use sub-quality or incomplete training data. So what I really want to do at this point is maybe discuss a approach which we call data-centric AI. And the reason why I'm so excited about this is it combines the best of rules-based systems in being iterative and model-based approach, which is very good at modeling complexity. To really understand DCAI, data-centric AI, it's important to understand what a labeling function is. So to understand a labeling function, let's maybe contrast it with manual labeling. In manual labeling, you have people who are going through every single data point and labeling it individually. So you need eyeballs on as many data points as there are labels at the end of the day. This is a very inefficient process, but one also important consequence of this is sometimes the logic or the reasoning used to make a decision ends up getting lost. Now contrast this with programmatic labeling. So here, a subject matter expert provides heuristics or logic of how to label. And these heuristics, which we call labeling functions, are used by the computer to then label the millions of data points. 
So the, the human does what the human does best, which is provide context and understanding in the form of these heuristics. And the computer does what the computer does really well, which is scale that using compute. And because that logic is captured, it's inspectable and auditable. This knowledge can include the SME's own heuristics. It can also leverage organizational resources such as existing rule-based systems or ontologies. And we've even seen some advanced users of programmatic labeling leverage advanced concepts like foundation models as signals in the programmatic labeling. And what you will notice here is that we're not saying that every one of these labeling functions is pure or has to be perfect but rather that each of these units is contained and isolated, which makes the system as a whole much more manageable. These knowledge inputs, these labeling functions, are then treated as a source of a weak signal, which are combined to label the data at large. Programmatic labeling relies on theoretically grounded weak supervision techniques to denoise and reconcile each source of signal in order to output the best training label for each data point. And because each of these training labels is encoded using the labeling functions, it makes the overall system much more manageable, interpretable, and governable. And we built an entire development paradigm that leverages programmatic labeling. So when you think about it, because we have programmatic labeling, we are now able to label much faster. So it takes an order of magnitude less time to create the lab training data. The consequence of this is that you can now focus much more time on improving the quality of the training data to drive better model performance. And every time you notice that your model performance is degrading or it's not at the bar, you can ask what if questions to analyze whether the source of the error is the data or the model. Here's a little dirty secret that I've learned. It's usually the data that you have issues with. So now as part of the iterative model development experience, you can go back to the data, update your labeling functions, and with a push of a button, relabel it in a matter of a few minutes. And if you notice once the application is in production, model performance is degrading because of data drift or concept drift, you can really isolate the source of that drift to individual label functions of which there are dozens and update them to then relabel the entirety of the data. And as a result of this, you now keep the model relevant to changes in your business. This entire paradigm of application development and maintenance that is built around programmatic labeling and the core data foundation is something that we call data-centric AI. And it's a very core tenant of the Snorkel Flow platform. And using this approach, we have produced an array of proof points across various different industries. So what you're seeing on the screen are some examples of measured acceleration that our customers and research partners have observed when they use the Snorkel Flow platform. These help underscore how repeatable this process is across different customers, different use cases, and different industry. And I'm happy to talk about each and every one of these if it's of interest to you. But what I want to do at this point is dive deep into one of these case studies to lift the lid and show you how this works. So I want to spend some time talking about a Fortune 500 bank that we worked with. Uh, one of the emerging trends in financial services is a move online for customer service. And the hope is that by making customer service more real time, more on demand, it improves customer satisfaction, reduces attrition, and just provides an overall better financial product to the customer. COVID was a very testing time for a lot of banks because instantaneously, a lot of the services that used to happen at brick and mortar stores needed to go online. And it's not reasonable to expect the same call center task force to deal with what is effectively an exponential increase in the nature and number of tasks that people want to carry out. So what you really want is for your chatbot to be more adaptive and incorporate a larger number of intent or tasks that you want it to be able to respond to. 
to keep up with this rapidly changing ecosystem of customer intent and sentiment, the bank reached out to us for a scalable way to train and retrain their conversational AI model. So to just contextualize how it used to work before, it their bottleneck was hand labeling. It would take them almost 21 days to label their training data set every time they wanted to create a new intent, which meant that it took over a month, at time months, to get a new intent into production. And as you can imagine, this was too slow for them when COVID hit the American economy. Um, and the consequence of this is really that because the chatbots suffer from low accuracy and unresolved intents and questions, customers leave the chatbot and try to escalate it. So the bot containment rate as a metric lowers. But that has two consequences. Firstly, people have a bad experience. When people have a bad experience, they attrition and you, it causes customer churn. But also, it is more expensive to service a customer using a human agent than it is a chatbot. So this is actually costing the bank a lot more money in terms of uh, what it what what the cost of customer services. So in working with Snorkel, they were in a week able to build a high cardinality utterance classifier, and they trained this classifier over 30,000 programmatically labeled conversations. And this system that they have now set up on Snorkel Flow is able to take a new intent online in the matter of hours. So this takes two forms. If they have a new intent that they want to be able to add the system, they can label the data and take it online very rapidly, or if they detect a changing customer behavior or pattern, they can relabel the data by updating the labeling functions and take the system online very rapidly. In summary, what I really want to do is explain how data-centric AI is able to learn from the best of rule-based systems and model-based systems to accomplish this more responsive paradigm of creating value from AI. So to recap, in rule-based systems, you have a very adaptive and iteratable system, which is very accessible to a plethora of different persona personas. However, it's very limited in its ability to model complexity. It's very good for simple processes. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have these model-based systems that are fascinatingly good at modeling complexities, almost to points that we don't understand sometimes, but they're not very adaptive. And the root cause for that is the lack of adaptability and iteratability on the training data. With a data-centric approach, you're taking the best of rule-based systems and using that in the labeling process to rapidly label, analyze, and relabel data. And the best of the model-based approach to use that labeled data to train a model that is able to decipher and understand complex relationships. And we've seen our partners get a lot of value out of this. If this approach to AI application development and maintenance is interesting to you, we would love to have a discussion of how to make Snorkel Flow available and useful for your organization. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Arjun. And now um, we're going to be taking questions from the audience. As a reminder, you can still submit questions uh, through the Zoom Q&A pane, which is accessible at the bottom of your Zoom window. And uh, while we're waiting for a few questions to come in, Arjun, you know, a common question we get asked is, you know, what are the real differences between rules and labeling functions? I think this is probably a question I hear most often. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so the way I think about it is, rules have to be very precise. There's not a lot of room for error. In fact, there's no room for error. And the consequence of that tends to be that you don't take a lot of risks with them. Uh, so they're very limited in their ability to explain and they're very perfect at what they explain. But even if you have a slight intuition but are not 100% sure about it, you tend to not encode it because you, want, you would rather have a perfect system than an imprecise system. Um, the advantage of labeling functions is that they don't have to be perfect. Mathematically speaking, they just need to be more often right than wrong because the weak supervision label model does the work of denoising it by learning how they interact with each other to then create the final labeled training data. So it gives the subject matter expert a lot more room 
to capture intuition and you're not bottlenecked on expertise. So that's one of the major differences between rules and label functions in my mind. Great. Um, and how accessible are the labeling functions and programmatic labeling to non-data scientists? Yeah, uh, this is something that I get very excited because um, if I could just go back to this slide, there's labeling functions can take a variety of different forms. So on one end of the spectrum, you have the manual labels themselves that can be used, right? Uh, then you have some very simple subject matter uh, rules that can be used. And these can be very accessible to people who don't necessarily have a coding background, but understand some very simple Boolean logic. And then the other end of the spectrum, you have people who can write labeling functions in the form of code and very advanced users who can actually integrate foundation models as label functions. So there's really a plethora of different personas who can engage with it. And one of the things that the Snorkel team has really invested in is different UIs to engage different personas to be able to contribute and iterate on labeling functions. Great. Thanks everyone for fantastic questions this morning. If you're interested in learning more about Snorkel, you can reach out at info at snorkel.ai. We hope to see you again at a future webinar or event.